Good afternoon. Uh, we have put together a panel for you today so that we can end the conference uh, addressing some of the questions that you may have had about the workshops or the presentations that you've seen this weekend. The teachers sent us some questions ahead of time, so we have three questions that we will address as a group, and then we will open it up to the audience. Uh, we have students with microphones, so you can be thinking about what question you might like to ask today in the panel. First, we'll introduce everyone on the panel. Some of you may have met us or seen us, but some of us may be new to you. Uh, my name is Katherine Kaiser, and I am an uh, elementary school principal in New York City at the school at Columbia, which is the primary division, kindergarten, first, and second grade. Hi, my name is Sheila O'Shea, and I'm one of the music teachers at the School at Columbia. And um, creativity and working creatively is one of my passions and keeps me alive and interested in my job. Good afternoon, my name is Julie Broderick. I also teach at the School at Columbia with Catherine. I am a fifth grade homeroom teacher of math and literacy and social studies. And I got my start teaching in the public schools in New York City and am also very involved in teacher education, pre-service and in-service um, teacher professional development at a number of universities in New York. Good afternoon, I am Greg Benedict Grab. Um, I'm a science educator, um, a professional developer, and I also um, teach um, classes to undergraduates and graduates in, um, in education. And um, I'm here from Stevens Institute of Technology. I am Nikki Tuckerman, and I am a developmental psychologist. The panel title today is Creativity and Innovation in the Classroom and we're here to talk with you about the role of creativity in schools. Uh, the first question is, why is creativity an essential part of a 21st century education, and how do you assess it authentically? So we're gonna get three perspectives on some of these ideas. The first person will be Sheila O'Shea. I think that creativity is essential to education because it is an integral part of who we are as human beings, Children are naturally connected to their creativity, so for it not to be part of the educational process, I think is unnatural. Right now, we are living at a time when our world is evolving at a rapid rate. We live in a culture obsessed with testing, and at the same time, we are charged with preparing our students for the unpredictability of an unknown job market. And of course, we also want our students to grow up into happy, well-adjusted adults. I think that creativity is the obvious solution to these challenges for three interrelated reasons. One, it increases chances for success. Two, it fosters joy. And three, it validates our students for who they are at their deepest level. In other words, it has the power to change lives forever. I have worked with children creatively for over 20 years. I constantly see the positive effects of their success in my music class ripple into all other areas of learning as they develop more self-confidence and they feel happier. Their ability to focus, self-regulate, and their interpersonal relationships all improve. Creativity also develops incredible tenacity. I'm sure any of you in this room who've ever tried to write a poem or learn a piano piece, make a piece of art, all know that the creative process can be grueling. One has to try and try again and not give up. This is a really important life skill. So while test scores might open doors for someone in the job market, in some instances, I do not feel that test scores alone will ensure success or happiness. I also feel that as we progress into the 21st century, the pieces of paper and letters after our names will be used less and less as criteria for hiring. I am currently teaching a class about the composer John Cage to my 13-year-old children in New York. I was told before I started that one of my students can at times have behavioral problems such as inattentiveness and can be very disruptive. I was a little nervous. So during the first class, I taught them about John Cage's wild imagination and completely open-ended way of thinking. When the second class was just about to start, a week later, this boy came in excitedly sat down and was ready to work and loudly exclaimed, 
John Cage is my hero. I have to say that my heart stopped a little bit with joy. And I said, well, why is John Cage his hero? He's his hero because John Cage celebrated creativity in all of its forms. He expanded the parameters of what we even expect creativity to be. My student, who does not fit into the mainstream, felt validated and encouraged to express himself in his own unique way with no wrong answers. Ken Robinson has said that it is impossible to have any original ideas if one is not prepared to be wrong. He was not equating creative answers with being wrong, but rather emphasizing the necessity for students to have experiences other than the narrowness of being right or wrong. Right and wrong does not prepare our students to find multiple solutions to problems or to explore, possi or to explore possibilities, skills that are necessary for 21st century living. Therefore, it does not prepare our students for life. Fear tends to drown out our intuition, so our culture of testing is in direct conflict with what our students need in order to be successful in the 21st century. Right and wrong does not prepare our students to be able to navigate the uncertainty of the future. Renee Brown says that thriving amid uncertainty is about faith and self-trust, believing that whatever happens, you'll find a way through it. Without uncertainty, we would never take a risk or fall in love with someone new. There are no guarantees when we step into the unknown, but these periods of discomfort can give rise to life's most important adventures. What better and safer way is there for our students to experience the discomfort of the unknown other than through being creative? When a child creates something, it is an expression of who they are at their deepest level. When we validate that, we validate and celebrate who they are. They feel safe, valued, and connected. This is what gives our students the grounding and confidence to go forward successfully. To have our students leave school with an authentic sense of self, a joyous and curious perspective, and an openness to whatever life may bring is the biggest gift we can impart. Creativity offers all of that and more. With regard to assessment, I would assess creativity based on the level of engagement of the student and originality, because I believe that the creative process yields multiple outcomes and no wrong answers. I hope that we can find a way to not drown our intuition in fear of wrong and right answers, but instead, in the words of Ken Robinson, give our students the chance to wander in the wilderness of their intuitions through fully engaging in what they love to do. Thank you, Sheila. For another perspective on why creativity is an essential part of the 21st century education and how to assess it, Dr. Edith Ackerman. What I would like to add to what Sheila said is that when we think about constructing new knowledge, we are actually also thinking about learning to see things anew, learning to see things from another perspective. Now, if we think of ourselves as curious beings, and if we think of our rational mind, the way we proceed, and we necessarily proceed, is that we look at something new that we don't know, or something unfamiliar, as a kind of something that we already know. Jean Piaget used to call this assimilation. I impose my order upon things because it's the only way I can, in, at least in the first step, start to make sense of the uncertain, the unknown, in terms of what I know. I think that the creative process does the opposite. The creative process takes something that is normally automated, that is so part of what we are about, and starts to undoing it and to questioning. So it's actually transforming the mundane into the magical, the known into something that could be seen differently. 
Nowadays, many people talk about mindful engagement. Um, and I like the definition of Ellen Langer because what she says is to be mindful is the opposite of being an automatic pilot. It's the opposite of imposing our categories. That being mindful is adopting a beginner's mindset. And grown-ups, children do that wonderfully. They are always mindful of playing. But grown-ups need to actually voluntarily look at things in ways in which they otherwise wouldn't. And that capacity of looking at things from an unusual angle, the ability not to give more weight to the things that seem obvious because they have worked in the past. The ability to actually question and to be a little bit untrusting of our own ability to categorize the world. I think this is what creativity is about. And it has always been important. It's not a 21st century thing. But now that everybody's navigating in rust seas and nobody knows where we are going, everybody talks about creativity. But my sense is that creativity has always been and will always be very important. It's the, it's in a way, I think of it as the flip side of human imagination. Imagination is about, it's about establishing a dialogue between what is and what could be in the wildest of our minds. And creativity is not just about replicating something that exists, but it's bringing to life our wildest dreams. So to me, it is something that has a role. And children are very creative learners. See, that's where it comes together again. Because they allow themselves to change their minds in the middle of the... <laughs> and our last speaker on why creativity is an essential part of a 21st century education is Dr. Ota. Evet, yaratıcılık insan yaşamının önemli bir özelliği, insanın önemli bir özelliği ve insan aklıyla yaratıyor aslında. Ve bu yaratma işini eğer e, okulların eğitimini tek tipe dönüştürürsek bir süre sonra da köreldiğini biliyoruz. Oysa 21. yüzyılın teknolojik imkanları bize birçok şeyi daha kolaylıkla öğrenebilme, daha kolay pekiştirebilme fırsatını veriyor. O zaman bizim 21. yüzyıl insanını yetiştirirken yaratıcılığı ön plana almamız toplumsal gelişim içinde, bireysel gelişim içinde fevkalade önemli. Çünkü eğer bu yüzyılın insanı yeteri kadar yaratıcı olmazsa o zaman mevcutla yetinmek zorunda kalacak. Halbuki aldığı her topluluk, her dönemde insanoğlu başkaları da daha öncelerden aldığını bir ileriye götürme çabası içindi. Ve ancak bunu yapabilecekler de yaratıcı insanlar. Edit'in dediği gibi çocuk Piaget'in görüşüne göre önce bir durgunluk dönemi geçiriyor emin verdiği cevaplarla ama bir süre sonra bir rahatsızlık duymaya başlıyor ve yeniden bir e, karmaşık döneme ya da rahatsızlık duyduğu döneme girince verdiği cevaplarda yeni şeyler aramaya başlıyor. Aslında yaratıcılık bir şeylere, var olan bir şeylere, yeniden bir şeyi sıfırdan var etmeniz gerekmiyor ama var olan şeylere farklı şekilde bakabilmek e, sayfanın arkasını ya da olayın arkasını da görebilmek ve tabii ki yeni çözümler farklı, yaşama uygun, 
gerçekleşebilir çözümler yaratmak. Bu da aslında mutlaka ve mutlaka hayal gücüyle çok yakından ilgili. Ama hayal gücü hayal olarak kalabilir. Yaratıcı olmanın bir özelliği belki de bunu yaşama geçirebilecek bir takım çözümleri de beraberinde getirmek diye düşünüyorum. Elbette ki bugünün sınav sistemiyle yaratıcılığı ölçmek pek mümkün görünüyor. Çünkü yaratıcı insanlar bu sınav sisteminde ya sıkılıyorlar ya da başarısız oluyorlar. Mümkün değil. Çünkü onlar sıra dışı insanlar. O zaman onların yaptıklarını da değerlendirecek, orijinal olanı değerlendirecek bir takım çözüm yolları, değerlendirme yolları da bulmamız lazım. Ama burada özellikle yaratıcı bireyleri yetiştirmede öğretmenin rolü, ailenin rolü çok önemli ve öğretmen yaratıcı değil, bilakis çok sınırlı bir anlatım ve bilgi dağarcığına sahipse nasıl yaratıcı yapacak? Çünkü yaratıcılık bir şeylere 360 derece bakabilmeyi beraberinde getiriyor. Bizim tek tipli cevaplarımız hiçbir zaman yaratıcılığa götürmüyor. Ee, geçenlerde bir gazeteci aradı beni, bir araştırma yapılmış. Sanıyorum Kanada'da yetenek ve yaratıcılık yönünden Türkiye biraz arka sıralar. Bu aslında bizim eğitim sistemimizin ve onun sonucundaki sınav sistemimizin getirdiği bir şey. Bence yaratıcılık potansiyel olarak doğuştan var olan bir özellik ama bunun geliştirilmesi, bunun desteklenmesi ancak sosyal ve eğitim ortamı içinde mümkün. Biz bunu yapabiliyor muyuz? Bu biraz vakit alan, öyle müfredatla sınırlı olmayan bir şey. Çünkü yaratıcı çocuklar bir şeyin derinine kadar inebiliyorlar. Bizim gördüğümüzden farklı şeyleri görebiliyorlar. Ve onların buldukları çözümler de bazen sıradan insanın aklına pek yatmıyor. Ama sıradanlık çoğunluk e, yaratıcılık azınlık olunca onlar hep dışlanan çocuklar oluyor. O zaman bunun önüne geçmek önüm gerekli diye düşünüyorum. Ve 21. yüzyıl insanının temel özelliklerinden birinin yaratıcılık ve buna paralel olarak üreticilik olması gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Thank you, Dr. Oktay. Another question that the teacher shared with us was that we're thinking about creative uses of technology, which a lot of the workshops uh, this weekend were about. How can an emphasis on using this technology support the social, the emotional, and the academic development of all of the children, even though they're in different places in their development? How can we use the technology to support their development? And we'll start this question with Julie Broder. Good afternoon. Uh, in my workshop that I was giving yesterday about bringing the city curriculum into your classroom, there was a visual that I showed that I found from a blogger online in, in England where she had taken uh, the essence of a London tube map or a New York subway map and she had mapped her life's learning journeys. And I shared it with the class and talked about how we use that idea with kids when we're um, talking about mapping in class. And there were about 10 different intersecting colored lines on her map that all represented different ways that she had learned in life. And there was a very small little disconnected colored line on the top of the map that was her formal schooling. And all of the other lines were other ways outside of school that she had been sparked to be uh, innovative and creative by other people in her life. And it really struck me, it struck, strikes me as very um, telling uh, that so many of our experiences probably were similar. And my hope as a teacher is really that when my students grow up and map their life learning journeys, that their formal education really is the spine of that map. And that all of the other lines are the things that they've chosen to pursue based on uh, exciting triggers that they've experienced in school, that I want my students to feel 
like they're being validated and their creativity is being peaked every day, all the hours that they spend in school with us. I think that's our biggest charge, that it's not just time that they're clocking and going outside of school to investigate their, their creative interests. So I really, you know, it's what Edith said, it's about helping kids see what's possible and nurturing that, that belief that anything is possible. And I feel very fortunate as a teacher, having been in the classroom for 20 years now, that I got my start as a teacher when there was not technology available for me. And I didn't use it in my practice in the early years because it wasn't widely available to us in our schools. And I really was able to hone my practice as a teacher, learning about children, learning about assessing children, learning about developing curriculum. And I feel grateful that I was able to do that and bring technology into my classroom as a layer that I add on to all of that best practice. So we spoke a lot yesterday morning about specific ways that we bring different programs and different software into the classroom. And I feel like today it would almost be a, a dishonor to the, the theme of the day to go so kind of item by item, but, but to talk more globally about that as a tool that we use to help invigorate and spark that curiosity in kids. So giving children the time and technology is often a tool that gives us more time in the classroom, that allows students to collaborate with children beyond the room where we work, that gives us as teachers abilities to collaborate in meaningful ways with colleagues so that we're able to bring richer material into the classroom for them, that we're able to document the work that they do the creative work that they do and share it with an audience beyond the four walls of our classroom door, I think are, are key pieces of, of helping children develop that creativity in school. Julie, thank you. <laughs> Greg is also gonna speak a little bit about uh, using technology to support the development of a range of children. Yes, I think um, Julie explained that really well. Um, and I would just add that it's not, it's not about the technology that creates deep and rich learning, it's about the deep and rich learning environments and the deep and rich activities that we create. And sometimes the technology can help us make those activities and make those experiences, but that it really comes down to having quality learning environments in our classroom. Um, and that, and technology is just one tool for that. Um, and I'll just give one quick example. Um, I did an activity with sixth graders where we built robots where they got to think about how the robots would explore Mars and they accomplished various challenges um, that they might have to face if they were programming a robot that would explore Mars. And what made this activity powerful was that difference, there were many different entry points and many different results in the project. So all children um, in the project could um, push themselves to the right amount, but also um, feel successful um, in the project. And so I think by creating activities that are maybe a little bit more like that subway map in our classrooms, we can allow students to be differentiated and to have those experiences that fit what they need. Um, and sometimes technology can help us get there but by itself, it doesn't, it doesn't get us there. It's about creating the right environment. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> Edith, did you want to add anything to that question, or shall I move on to the next one? Uh, I just want to say that the one thing I learned in working at MIT for so long is that sometimes it is difficult to talk about either the role of technology in education or creative uses of technology, because the word technology is so broad. So I just want to, to, to, to bring it back again. So the, I, I said, you know, as a joke, uh, we call technology any tool that was invented after I am born. That is one part of the story. The other part of the story is that every micro world that we, or every tool that we offer to our children <laughs> needs to be understood as a part of 
context or a scenario of use in which it becomes meaningful. So I would like to give just a quick example on robotics. When you work with interdisciplinary teams, <coughs> what happens, for example, we created a robot that follows lights. From a point of view of technologists and the coders, it's just a robot that has two sensors that is sensitive to light, and when it receives light on one side of its head, it turns to the right, and when it receives light on the other side of the head, it turns to its left. Me, as a psychologist, I look at the children playing. So I give you three things that usually the coders don't no notice the difference. In one case, you have the sun that comes into an environment, and the robot just goes like and it goes blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah, blah. And in a way, it's doing its thing, independently of you. It's just responding to its environment. But then eventually, the child realizes that if she has a, a flashlight in her hand, the same little robot is going to follow her. And the, ch the little child says, this is wonderful because it's like a pull-along toy, but I don't need to attach it to a string for it to follow me. It, it means that it's loving me. And yet another scenario is you just put that same light on the shoulder of the robot and you put some scotch tape around and then the robot forever turns in a circle. So it means that this quality of this tendency it has to go towards the sun turns into a built-in genetic wired in tendency of that creature. Now, what the children love is to play with these differences, is to understand what their role is in, in relation to the toy, how it responds to its environment. Is it light, not light, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine, you are educators, you know. But when I spoke at the beginning with my coders about this difference, they say, and so what's the difference? It's just a machine, it, it receives, it, it, is sensed, it has actuators and sensors, and it responds to the light, you know, and sometimes this, this make it difficult if you actually collaborate on projects with these different expertises. So the, the, the scenarios of use are very important. So I consider these the three examples that I gave you very creative uses by the children, but, but not that just the children, but the people who had the idea, the idea of putting a robot in the water instead of on Earth is wonderful because it opens all these different possibilities. So just to give an example, it's, uh, it's these scenarios. So I think in the teams, you need designers. The designers are always the ones we don't think about. We have engineers, <coughs> architects, educators. Eventually, yeah, the designers are very important <laughs> because they, they, they, they can bring it to life. They can. Thank you, Edith. Edith. Edith also leads us into our last question, which Dr. Oktag talked about uh, yesterday as well, uh, is really about what's more valuable, what's more appropriate for children. Is it interacting with other people, using materials, and observing actual experience, or are the virtual and the technological substitutes, which is better and uh, more valuable to children? And we talked about this a lot in our different talks. So we're going to hear from some different perspectives, and we'll start with Greg. Okay. Um, we, there's, I guess, a danger I fall into as an educator. Sometimes I answer a question with a question. Um, it can annoy students and other people. Um, I guess my question is, why do we need to decide between face-to-face -face and virtual? Um, and what I want to say about that is that I think face-to-face -face experiences are important. This is why we built schools. Um, this is why we come together. I don't, I don't see um, a productive education world without face-to-face -face, um, experiences. I think it's a really important part. Um, I guess the opportunity that I see 
is that with virtual connections, um, and we've spoken about a variety of virtual ways or technological ways to connect, um, I think there's opportunity to broaden and deepen connections that already take place face to face. So by combining the two, maybe we can have more. Um, and I will give a quick example. Um, I've talked, I had a talk this morning where I spoke about sharing ideas digitally, sharing data digitally. Um, and I think that within the classroom walls, that can make the experience for the students more rich because they can communicate face to face and they can share their ideas over a computer or with a device. Um, but it also offers even greater opportunities because those connections can go beyond the school walls in terms of time. Um, connections can happen beyond the school day um, because students are only together for a certain amount of time. And those connections can go geographically so that students can connect from around the world. Um, and I've shared some projects where students connect from different countries, um, from different areas, or even connect to adults. Um, I gave an example um, in one talk where students were able to talk to a scientist in Antarctica. Um, there wasn't an opportunity for them to meet the scientist face to face because the scientist was busy collecting data in Antarctica. But over a Skype session, they could gain a lot from each other by having a conversation. So I guess those are the opportunities I see um, in combining the two rather than making it a choice. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ackerman, would you like to add anything? Safety. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I just wrote a note for myself that says none of the above, meaning I don't want to choose between these different modalities. Uh, the relationships between direct and mediated experience are much more complex than any of us can wrap their minds around. Uh, if I have a pen pal when my grandmother was young and I sent letters to a child in Africa, uh, this is also mediated, um, so I don't want to repeat uh, what, what uh, Greg said. Um, the, the only thing is, I think, to understand that young children have an amazing knowledge about how to address the question of getting to know more about what they know they cannot directly experience. And here I would like to refer to the work of Paul Harris in a book called The Work of the Imagination, where he distinguishes between different kinds of children, and this re relates to your talk this morning. Um, he calls them autonomous agents versus trustworthy disciples. So if I have to give my opinion about how viruses work or what's on the moon or something. Even as a four-year-old, I know that I cannot experience it directly. So I use my intelligence to know who around me in my extended family is the awkward uncle or dad or mom who is actually going to give me some kind of view that is useful to me or funny or reliable. And not enough studies have been done on what the children actually do when they know that they cannot directly experience something. Um, so that's, that's my question. Thank you, Dr. Ackerman. Uh, Professor Dr. Oktai, you talked to us about this yesterday. Yes. <laughs> Ee, aslında dünkü konuşmamda ben biraz buna değindim diye düşünüyorum. Ee, bugün elimizde pek çok imkan var. Teknoloji bize eğitimi ve öğrenmeyi desteklemek adına çok malzeme sağlıyor, imkan sağlıyor. Ama bu çocukları diğer çocuklarla etkileşim içinde olmaktan geri bırakmak anlamını da taşımamalı. Onun için bana göre Burada bunun bu uygun, öbürü mü uygun sorusu yerine biz bütün bu mevcut imkanlarımızı, bu bizim elimizde bugün var olan 
fırsatları çocuğun eğitiminde en iyi nasıl kullanırız düşünmek durumundayız. Çocuğun diğer çocuklarla oynamaya ihtiyacı var. İletişim kurmaya ihtiyacı var. E, ellerini, kollarını dokunmaya, bir şeyler yapmaya ihtiyacı var. Ama bunları yaparken teknoloji bu desteği, bunu yapmasını kolaylaştıran bazı destekler sağlıyorsa, elbette ki teknolojiden de yararlanmak son derece önemli. Burada çocuğun neye ihtiyacı var? Biz çocuğu nasıl bir dünyaya hazırlıyoruz? Bu çok önemli. Ama yaşadığımız dünyada hala insan ilişkileri fevkalade önemli. Ve bizim belki de en büyük kusurlarımızdan biri, yeteri kadar iletişimi beceremiyor olmamız. İletişim uzmanı hocamız burada. Toplumdaki çatışmaların pek çoğu iletişim sorunu diye karşımıza çıkıyor aslında. Elinden yakından baktığımızda. O zaman mutlaka iletişim, yüz yüze iletişim, mutlaka çocuğun bir şeyler yapması, çünkü özellikle erken dönemde, Çocuk dokunacak, korkmayacak, tadacak ki kolaylıkla öğrenebilsin. Ama bunları kokuyu sanal ortama taşıyamazsınız. Belki rengi taşırsınız. Ama renk ancak iki boyutlu taşırsınız. Üç boyutlu taşıyamazsınız. O zaman aslında teknolojinin de öğrenmede bazı sınırlıkları var. Yaşamdan öğrendikleriyle teknolojiyi destekleyerek verilecek bir öğretim ortamının, yaratılacak bir öğretim ortamının ben bugünün çocukları için oldukça yararlı olacağını düşünüyorum. Yani birine öbürüne tercih etmek değil, hepsini birlikte uygun koşullarda kullanmanın becerisini biz özellikle öğretmenlerimizde geliştirmeliyiz. Thank you so much Professor Dr. Aptay. Uh, we're going to open it up to the audience now, so if you have other questions, different questions that we haven't already addressed, things that you've been thinking about uh, during the three days that we've all been here, uh, this group is here to answer your questions. Just raise your hand and one of the students will come over with the microphone. Ah, I see a hand in the back. Hello, uh, my name is Burcin. I'm a parent at Sezin School, so I have a parent question for you. Uh, it was great listening to all of you guys. Uh, I, as a parent, learned a lot. Uh, maybe this will be an ignorant question, but I want to learn how much I mean, I, I'm you know, hearing about creativity and imagination, etc. But um, I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, and it's very difficult to keep the boys away from iPad or, you know, uh, these other games. So how much as parents, like how much time do you allow your kids to spend on gaming or on digital platforms and how much is helping? Because I know that like in the future, digital efficiency um, will be a very important skill. I don't want to keep them away from it, but I want them to, uh, have uh, creativity and imagination as well. So I'll appreciate if you can give me a, you know, a logical answer sure. as experts. I want to make sure that the translators heard the question and that everyone in the audience understands. It's a parent just asking for our perspective on how much is appropriate when interacting with technology as a parent. If we want our children to be creative and we want them to have technology skills, how much time is appropriate uh, for them to use these tools? And we'll open it up if anyone on the panel has a perspective and would like to share. We have some parents on the panel, too. I am a brand new step-parent of a seven-year-old girl for one month, so I am much newer to the world of parenting than Catherine and Greg, so maybe they can uh, talk a little bit about their perspectives in a few minutes. But as a teacher talking with parents about technology, I couldn't agree with you more that we want to, we don't want to hide things from them that are going to be important tools for them to be comfortable with in the world. And I think we all know that the more you pull something away from children, the more they want it. 
Um, so I think it's about balance and it's about um, using the tools with them when they're younger and choosing wisely and getting good advice from other educators and parents about good ways to use iPads and computers at home and putting them in public places where children are on them with adults around nearby doing activities with them on the devices and being really mindful that it you need to leave a lot of time for all of the other things we're talking about here today about experiencing the world and getting out and running and building and painting and drawing and singing and playing musical instruments and playing sports and all of those things that you don't do virtually. Um, but I think it's about balance and it's about being really involved in the digital life of your children. Um, and as, that, as they grow older, it's much more difficult, but just as important. Um, Catherine has older daughters and might want to talk about that. I know that Professor Oktai also wants to answer this question, but I can't help but think about our first speaker this morning uh, and the idea of parenting and whether it's the result or the process. And the iPad is a little bit like the toothbrushing. Uh, how you get your child to put down the iPad. It isn't just putting down the iPad, uh, it's the process and that relationship that you have at home about what's important and all the things that Julie spoke about, about that balance, helping to teach your child that part of being alive is being alive through all parts of yourself and that the technology and that tool or the television, that thing that you have your whole self sucked into isn't helping you to lead an active, balanced, related life with other people. So the process for parenting a child to make the choice to put down or turn off the TV and to go outside and to be with their friends because that's an important part of growing up and of being a whole person. And that's a really important piece that you have to train and, and work with your child on, not just to forbid it and put it down because I said to put it down, which means when you aren't looking, they're turning it back on again. Evet, burada vereceğimiz cevaplar birbirine oldukça benziyor. Bizi iki gündür dinliyorsunuz. Elbette çağımız çocuğu teknolojiyle ilgili, hem de çok ilgili. Onu bundan biz bütün koparmak gibi bir imkan da yok. Mümkün de değil, gerekli de değil. Ama e, saat ne kadar saat, ne kadar zaman o çocuk telefon bilgisayarla ya da teknolojiyle ilgilensin derseniz bu biraz da ne yaptığına bağlı, teknolojiyi nasıl kullandığına bağlı ve çocuğun gelişim seviyesine bağlı. Yani 3 yaşındaki bir çocuğu ne bileyim 5 saat tutamazsınız belki o ancak işte 15 dakika kalmalıdır. Onun dışında koşup oynamalı hatta kavga etmelidir diğer çocuklarla çünkü çatışmadan da öğrenilecek şeyler var. Yani mümkün olduğu kadar gerçek dünyayla temas kurup ondan sonra sanal dünyanın da keyfini çıkarsın çocuk aslında. Ama daha ileri yaşlarda elbette ki çocuklar ödev yapmak için de, bir takım bilgilere ulaşmak için de, birbirleriyle konuşmak, iletişim kurmak için de teknolojiyi kullanıyorlar. Onun için nasıl kullanıldığı burada çok önemli. Ve amacı ne? Neden onu öyle kullanıyor? Sadece oyun oynamak için kullanıyorsa o zaman e, belki biraz kısıtlama koymak düşünülebilir. Ama çocuğu hiçbir şekilde bugünün çocuğunu teknolojiden tam olarak uzaklaştırmanız mümkün değil. Aksine dinden beri bütün dinlediklerimiz teknolojiyi yaratıcı bir şekilde ve en uygun şekilde kullanarak Çocukları nasıl daha geliştirebiliriz, nasıl daha iyi bir öğrenme ortamı yaratırız onlarla, onun üzerineydi. Buradan hareket edersek, zaman vermek çok zor, bunu kimse böyle bir zaman veremez. Ama çocuğun bütün günlük faaliyetleri, yüz yüze, oyun, bahçe, sokak, neyse yapması gereken, onların dışında kalan zamanda, Bazen eğlenmek için, bazen bilgi edinmek için, bazen iletişim kurmak için teknolojiyi kullanması aslında kaçınılmaz bir şey gibi görünüyor. Yani.
before we go to the next question, I want to take a moment uh, about what you said and to think about even here in Turkey where we don't understand the language but we're watching other people and certainly in America, what are we as adults modeling for our children? How many families do you see where everyone in the family is looking at a device and there's a small child in the stroller watching everyone in the family completely invested in what's happening on this little screen? We are teaching our children by the choices that we make as well. Julie and I were at dinner last night and the entire family was on their phones except for the mother who appeared to not have a phone. And she's sitting there looking off into space while the husband and all the children at the table were on the phone. And so the dad loaned her his phone. <laughs> just so she could feel included in the activities. Uh, so pay attention to how you use technology too. It's what your children are watching um, and talk about it as a family. Uh, I think we have time for at least one more question. Anybody have something that they didn't get a chance to ask? Oh, there's one in the middle. Hi, thank you very much for this innovative and creative uh, panel and seminar. Uh, I'm a parent of two kids that stay in school and development in psychology, so I enjoyed uh, every uh, single seminar a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask something about attachments and technology. Uh, is there a relation, especially to Dr. Oktay <coughs> and, uh, Ed, and Dr. Edit, uh, is there a relation between the kids spending time uh, in front of technological devices and attachments to parents or world? Uh, I mean, I would like to take a notion uh, for, for the audience. Sure. So this is a, a psychological technical question, uh, very important. Is there a relationship uh, today uh, that, uh, b between attachment and time spent on technology? So if young children spend a certain amount of time on technology, is there a relationship with the way that they attach? And she would like the perspective of the two psychologists. <laughs> This is such a difficult question that I have one idea. It is to give you a reference of a book by a woman called Sherry Turple. And the title of the book is Together Alone. where she looks at the computer as a tool to understand our own relations to other people. And she talks about the gains and the losses experientially of having relationships to machines rather than people. <laughs> so she used to be very optimistic. She said, if a person has problems to communicate with other people, it can be very useful at some moment to be able to communicate with a more neutral device. But now that this becomes prevailing in our culture, she completely changed her mind. She also became older, and now she's actually ad yeah, she's addressing this question as a psychoanalyst. She's a psychoanalyst. And she looks very, in a certain way, into you know, the very fine line between um, actually enriching <laughs> your sense of existing and other people existing and your ability <laughs> to be empathic um, and attached actually versus having these convenient artificial others that allow you to be engaged without ever having a commitment in a way because you know that there is no need for commitment. So 
I prefer to leave the answer to her. Thank you. It's a hard question. <laughs> Bir soru geldi. Biz o dersi çalışmamıştık diyeceğiz. Bitireceğiz işi. Şimdi tabii e, bağlanmayla, e, teknolojiye bağlanma mutlaka ilişki üzerinde düşünülmesi gereken bir konu. Ama e, birebir ilişkisi var mı derseniz onun üzerinde biraz durmak lazım. Olmaya da bilir. Ama Herhangi bir şeye aşırı derecede bağlanan insanların diğer bir bağlanma sorunu olma olasılığı pek hala mümkün gibi görünüyor. Ama bunun doğrusunu isterseniz araştırılması üzerinde çok fazla fikrim yok. Çünkü bu biraz daha psikanalitik bir bakış açısını da getiriyor. Ama gelişimsel olarak anne çocuk bağlanması belli bir yaşa kadar normal. Ama ondan sonra bağlanma devam ediyorsa sorun ortadadır. Ee, biraz evvel arkadaşımızın söylediği gibi eğer anne her dakika bir bilgisayar ekranından şeylere bakıyorsa çocuklar da onu model alıp onlar da bağlanıyor adeta. Çünkü biz rol modeliz çocuklar için aynı zamanda. Söylediklerimizden daha çok yaptıklarımıza bakıyor çocuklar. Onun için yetişkinin çocuk olduğu durumdaki davranışlarını çok iyi gözden geçirmesi lazım. Ve e, herhalde bu attachment ile ilgili çok da çalışma yapılacaktır ileride diye düşünüyorum. Şimdilik biraz şey olabilir ama olmayabilir. Teşekkür, Teşekkür ederim. And should be researched. Um, what, what do we have a question? You know, I just need to add a half a sentence. My own $2.50 take on this is that I do notice uh, disturbances in attachment. It's more cultural, but there is a sense in which the capacity to empathize can be uh, in jeopardy under certain conditions. And um, This goes in a very interesting way, almost a little bit counter what you were saying this morning. You spoke very eloquently about the trade-offs of convivial versus sort of more didactical cultures and the individual versus the extended family that swallows everybody and the black sheep remains out. I mean, a, a most beautiful picture than this I never heard. On the other hand, if you go to the extreme of the individualist, of the family K, instead of the family S, or I don't remember in which order, there is also very annoying side effects. And what I believe is that we are in a very difficult position. We have to reinvent the extended family of the S and Ks, S plus Ks. Because what the child wants, the children are very good at knowing to whom to talk in order to get what. That's the only thing we don't have to teach to them. But it is very important to know what kind of weird, bizarre uncles, aunts, mothers, siblings, with each with their own weird obsessions, because we are all bizarre. What would make for a good extended family? And I think this is a very difficult question because we have to invent it. You know, it's neither the American individualistic model, whatever that means, nor your Turkish, like the over or, or the Jewish mama figure and so on. It's, it's none of these families may be the solution. It would be very nice to have your view on this actually. Your own two dollar fifty tape right now. <laughs> so. Yes, Martha. Ageless school, you know, it was the name of the conference, but we didn't unfortunately uh, give her enough time. And uh, yesterday, because I was with her, I have the chance of her explaining it more. I, I think people would would have question marks on, you know, how you define 
the school walls being edgeless. What did you mean by that? If you can just open a little. Very quickly. Thank you. Uh, what I call the edgeless school is not a formless school. Uh, what I call the edgeless school is a school that needs to enter in a dialogue with other educational institutions, whether they are formal or informal educational settings. And the reason for this is that nowadays, at least in my corner of the woods, no one institution can be made responsible for the lifelong learning uh, of our growing populations and, and, and, and earning. And this is partly because we do know that people can learn more things out of school. So the difficulty is not to create a sort of uh, um, spaceless and formless uh, network of herbs, but that each of these places, like the school, has to rethink its identity, but it has to remain a school. It shouldn't look exactly like the Science for the Children Museum, which has to rethink itself and its relation to the school, but should remain a children's museum. And the cyber cafe, where they go more and more, the cyber cafe is wonderful new space, and it has to actually redefine its relation with the school and the library. And the library itself is no longer just about reading books, but it's about uh, multimedia production. And I love the example of the, of the Seattle Public Library, which is done by Cool House. It's a, it's a beautiful library, but it happens everywhere. And what I call the edgeless school is a school that is able to think its own um, facilities as one of different herbs and that also begins to think how it is used for example at night when the school is empty and the school has a beautiful auditorium how to bring the community in how to bring people from the school in other safe places how to have the children <coughs> present their performances somewhere where it normally wouldn't be shown just as a way to uh, put in a dialogue these different, it's almost like personas, these different places have a very different feel to them. And my suggestion is to keep them their identity, but put them in a dialogue. It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's happening. And I think the only thing we can do is to collect the nice examples and to be inspired by them in order to continue our own work. I think that this weekend's conference hosted by Cezanne School has been an example of an edgeless school where we were invited from very far away, many of us, some from the past and some from the present or the future, and I feel like we've been invited into a dialogue. So I think I can speak for all of us when I express appreciation to the school for having us, for having this conference uh, and introducing us to your teachers and to your community. Thank you very much.